Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 11th. Today, we celebrate a woman who was once the wealthiest woman in England, and she happily spent a fortune on plants. We also celebrate the man who transformed his family farm into a glorious garden. And we'll learn about the Oxford professor who is remembered by a flower known as the jewel of the desert. Today's unearthed words feature thoughts on winter. And we grow that garden library with a book that will help you develop a botanist vocabulary. I'll talk about a garden item that you can buy that I use all the time. And then we'll wrap things up with some sweet February folklore. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. Here's today's curated articles. First up is an article that was featured in The English Garden, and it's congratulating Penelope Hobhouse, who won the Society of Garden Designers Lifetime Achievement Award for 2020. Past winners include Pete Audolf, Beth Chatto, and Christopher Bradley Hall. The award recognizes Penelope's outstanding contribution to landscape and garden design. You can get inspired and grow with her many books on garden design and garden history. If you'd like to read this article about Penelope, and she's had such an amazing life, you can find it easily in the listener community for the show on Facebook. Just search for Penelope, and this post will pop right up. Then next up was a post that was written by Jessica Walliser over at Savvy Gardening. The post was called Fertilizer Numbers, What They Mean and How to Use Them to Grow Better. This is an excellent comprehensive post on fertilizer, a topic that can be confusing for many gardeners. If you know your numbers and what they mean, you'll be able to use them to help you grow in your garden even better this year. As Jessica points out, NPK stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now, when you're in the store and you're buying a bag of fertilizer, the description may not expressly say NPK, but you'll at least see a series of three numbers. Now, how do plants use NPK? Well, as Jessica points out, nitrogen promotes shoot and leaf growth. So adding it to a green leafy vegetable plant like spinach or lettuce makes sense. The middle number represents P or phosphorus, and that generates fruit, flower, and root production. It's great for root crops like beets and carrots and onions, as well as for encouraging flower and fruit production. And then finally, the K, the last number, is referring to the potassium, and that affects a plant's hardiness and vigor. There is so much information in this post. Jessica really did a comprehensive job. And if you'd like to read all about fertilizer and better understand your numbers, what they mean, and how to use them to grow better, just search for the word fertilizer in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will pop up. Now, if you'd like to check out any of these curated articles, any of the articles that I talk about on the show, you can do it as well simply by joining the Facebook group for the show. It's a free listener community in Facebook, and all you have to do is the next time you're in Facebook, just head on up to the search bar, type in the Daily Gardener community, and then the listener community for the show will pop up. 
You can request to join. I'll get a notification on my phone. And then it's that simple. I'll admit you into the group and then you'll have access to the group and all of the articles. They'll actually start to show up in your Facebook feed intermixed among pictures and updates from your friends and family. And best of all, there's absolutely no spam in the group. I take great pains to curate good garden articles for you guys. I share it all in the group for free. These are articles that I hand curate that I enjoy myself, and I'm happy to share them with you. So, Take advantage of it. Join the Daily Gardener community. And by the way, I'd love to meet you in the group. And if you have good garden articles of your own or garden poetry or pictures of your garden that you'd like to share in the group, that would make my day. So go ahead, take advantage of it. Join the Daily Gardener community in Facebook. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the British aristocrat, naturalist, plant lover, and botanist, Margaret Cavendish Bentick, the Duchess of Portland, who was born on this day in 1715. Margaret married when she was 19 years old. She always went by Maria to her family and friends. Together, she and William Bentinck had five children. One of their sons even became the prime minister twice. When William died after their 27-year anniversary, Maria threw herself into her many passions. As the wealthiest woman in England, Maria could acquire virtually any treasure from the natural world, And she did. She cultivated an enormous collection of natural history, which was tended by two experts she hired personally to attend to each item, the naturalist Reverend John Lightfoot and the Swedish botanist Daniel Solander. Maria's home was referred to by society as the hive. It was the hub of activity for Solander and Lightfoot and the other people who helped process her acquisitions. At one point, Maria had reached out to Captain James Cook and had secured some shells from his second expedition to Australia. Daniel Solander was focused on cataloging Maria's massive shell collection, but sadly left the work unfinished when he died in 1782. Maria had an enormous appetite for curation and collecting. In addition to the botanic garden on her property, Maria opened a zoo, kept rabbits, and had an aviary. It's no wonder that a constant stream of scientists, explorers, socialites, and artists visited her to exchange ideas and to inspect her collections. And think about the limitless ambition she must have had as Lightfoot wrote that Maria wanted every unknown species in the three kingdoms of nature described and published to the world. Now, Maria had a special love for collecting plants and flowers from far off places from around the world. She retained the botanist and the incomparable botanical illustrator Georg Dionysius Eret as her personal drawing instructor. Struck by the luminescence of his work, Maria bought over 300 of his paintings. Maria also became friends with the botanical artist Mary Delaney. Mary made botanical paper mosaics, as she called them. She was essentially creating flower specimens out of tissue paper. Mary was exacting, dissecting real flowers and then replicating what she saw with tissue paper. 
To gather more material for her work, Maria and Mary love to go out into the fields and collect specimens together. As the Duchess of Portland, Maria shared her specimens with the public, and she displayed her various collections from around the globe in what she called her Portland Museum. Once in 1800, Maria received a rose from Italy, which became known as the Portland Rose, in her honor. The rose was a beautiful crimson scarlet with round petals, and it was a repeat bloomer. And here's a fun fact. All Portland roses were developed from that first Portland rose, the sweet gift to Margaret Cavendish Bintink, the Duchess of Portland. And today is the anniversary of the death of the poet and landscape gardener, William Shinstone, who died on this day in 1763. In the early 1740s, Shinstone inherited his family's dairy farm, which he transformed into the Lezos. The transfer of ownership lit a fire under Shinstone, and he immediately started changing the land into a wild landscape, something he referred to as an ornamented farm. Shinstone wisely bucked the trend of his time, which called for formal garden design. He didn't have the money to do that anyway, yet what Shinstone accomplished was quite extraordinary. His picturesque natural landscape included water features like cascades and pools, as well as structures like temples and ruins. Now, what I love most about Shinstone is that he was a consummate host. He considered the comfort and perspective of the garden from the standpoint of his visitors. When he created a walk around his estate, he wanted to control the experience. So Shinstone added seating every so often along the path to cause folks to stop and admire the views that Shinstone found most appealing. Then he incorporated signage with beautiful classical verses and poems, even adding some of his own, which elevated the Lezo's experience for guests. After his death, his garden, the Lezos, became a popular destination, attracting the likes of William Pitt, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. And it was William Shinstone who said, Grandeur and beauty are so very opposite that you often diminish the one as you increase the other. Variety is most akin to the latter, simplicity to the former. And today is the birthday of the 19th century professor of botany at Oxford University, as well as a chemist and geologist, Charles Daubeny, who was born on this day in 1795. The herbarium at Oxford is named in his honor, as is the Daubinia genus in the Hyacinth family. In 1835, the genus was described by the British botanist John Lindley. Lindley named it in honor of his peer, Charles Daubeny, in recognition for his experiments in vegetable chemistry, which improved our understanding of plant physiology. Native to South Africa, up until 2000, Daubinia was thought to have a single species, Daubinia aurea, or golden Daubinia. But then it was expanded by John Manning and Peter Goldblatt to include additional genera, 
these hyacinth varieties with the common name Jewel of the Desert, Delbinia, grow flat on the ground and have a single large red or yellow bloom, growing only on the Rogvelt mountain range in South Africa, Delbinia blooms every September. In unearthed words, here are some thoughts on winter. This first one's from Stanley Crawford from his Garlic Testament, Seasons on a Small New Mexico Farm from 1992. Winter is a time of promise because there is so little to do or because you can now and then permit yourself the luxury of thinking so. And here's a joke from Billy Connolly, the Scottish stand-up comedian. There are two seasons in Scotland, June and winter. And here's a poem called The Lilt of the Year. It's by a Los Angeles poet named Hazel Del Crandall. A melancholy mantle rests upon the land, the sea. The wind in tristful cadence moans a mournful threnody. There flits no gleeful insect no blithesome bee nor bird. Over all the vast of nature, no joyful sound is heard. In garments sere and somber, each vine and tree is clad. It's dreary-hearted winter, and all the earth is sad. And finally, here's an excerpt from Where the Forest Murmurs by William Sharp, who wrote under the pseudonym Fiona McCloyd. He was a Scottish writer and poet. Go to the winter woods. Listen there. Look. Watch. And the dead months will give you a subtler secret than any you have yet found in the forest. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, A Botanist Vocabulary by Susan K. Pell and Bobby Angel. This book came out in May of 2015, and it describes and illustrates, which is so helpful, a whopping 1,300 terms. Bobby and Susan introduce their book this way. We have attempted to define terms used by botanists, naturalists, and gardeners alike to describe plants. The included terms mostly refer to plant structures and come from the horticultural and botanical literature and practice. Many terms are not easily defined or illustrated. If they were, the botanical kingdom would not be as rich and engaging as it is. Please wander through the book to recognize the easily applied terms and learn a few unusual ones, but also use the book as a reference when you're stumped by a field guide or a strange-looking fruit. We hope your newfound knowledge helps you gain an even greater appreciation for the world of plants. You can get a used copy of A Botanist Vocabulary by Susan K. Pell and Bobby Angel and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $14. And here's today's gift for a gardener. It's King Lake's Natural Jute Twine. It comes packed on a coil. You get 328 feet of two-ply jute twine. It's an Amazon Choice and Amazon Prime product, so free shipping, and there's a 100% customer satisfaction guarantee. 
You can get King Lake's 328 feet of natural jute twine and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for $5.99. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. February joined the calendar with January around 700 BC. The etymology of the name February comes from a Latin word, which means purification. February generally has 28 days, except in a leap year like this year, in which case it has 29 days. Sometimes sayings about February aren't very kind, like the translation of this French saying, which says, February is the shortest month and by far the worst. February is the shortest month, but it's also National Cherry Month and National Grapefruit Month. And there's some wonderful folklore regarding the month of February, especially as it pertains to the weather. I thought I'd share some of them with you today to close the show. Married in February's sleety weather, life you'll tread in tune together. It's better to see a troop of wolves than a fine February. If a hedgehog casts a shadow at noon, winter will return. If February gives much snow, a fine summer it doth foreshow. Fogs in February mean frosts in May. And finally, a wet February, a wet spring. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org. And be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.